Thank you very much. Um, I want to give a big thank you to the people who organized this conference for this invitation, and that means a whole bunch of dynamic ASU law students uh, with whom I had the pleasure of talking last night. Uh, I'm glad to be here. When uh, the suggestion that I speak came, I realized that this was, after 30 years of sports studies conferences, going to be uh, a new one for me, because I had not addressed directly the entertainment sphere. Uh, by the way, I want to remind you that uh, we've got 40 minutes. I'm sharing this time with uh, Professor March, and so I'm going to look at that clock and take uh, 20 minutes, and hopefully there will also be time for discussion. So to get right to the point, uh, as somebody who has studied performance enhancing drugs, various enhancements in and outside of the sports world uh, for the last 25 years, the question is, what is the relationship between doping and the sports entertainment industry? And what I can do in the time available is to raise some questions and topics. Uh, there is a um, PDF that actually, Kellen, we don't need right now, uh, but that is certainly available to anybody who wants to review the bullet points and the newspaper documentation that supports it. So, straight to the point. Number one, <clears throat> are drugs necessary uh, in some sports to produce commercially viable performances? That's, that's one question. Uh, number two, does the public publicizing of doping by elite athletes uh, hurt business. Now, this is an issue that was hot uh, earlier in, you know, around 2003, 2004, as the Balco scandal was expanding. Uh, there was some interesting survey data demonstrating that uh, the public does not have, there's not a unanimous public so far as opinions about whether or not you care about doping athletes. Uh, is, is really real. How does the, the public, so the, the public is one of the most mysterious phenomena on earth, uh, but it is relevant to professional sports leagues for obvious reasons. Number three, does the sports entertainment industry have a responsibility to engage in what you might call social engineering aimed at minimizing drug use in the general population and young people in particular. This is the so-called role modeling argument. Uh, one answer to this question is an emphatic yes, and it comes from the United States Congress. And it's come from the United States Congress uh, with emphasis ever since 2005, when Commissioner Selig sat in front of that committee, that House committee, uh, and, and really got torn up and a number of players have the same sort of experience. It was followed by a much gentler treatment of um, Paul Tagliabue uh, a month later in April of 05, or maybe we'll, we'll get to that. But <clears throat> the, the whole question of whether or not uh, professional sports organizations have a social obligation to engage in the campaign against performance enhancing drugs uh, is very much with us. And as a matter of fact, uh, just the other day in the paper was a picture of a very uncomfortable looking Mr. Bud Selig who had just been uh, posed the human growth hormone question. What are you going to do? You know, he got beat up on the steroids. Now he was not relishing the prospect of getting beat up on human growth hormone. And of course the NFL uh, has an issue with human growth hormone testing that is, is current and ongoing. The, the next topic I want to address is uh, doping and commercialism in the Tour de France. Tour de, the Tour de France began in 1903. Uh, it has been a, to one degree or another, a drug-dependent event ever since. Uh, in the 1890s, professional riders were taking strychnine, cocaine, heroin, and stuff like that. Uh, as, as stimulants, and the, there's been an enormous amount of publicity about uh, comprehensive doping in the Tour de France since the 1998 race uh, blew up 
with the, the arrests and the confiscations of all those drugs. Uh, to, to this point, uh, is the Tour de France a drug-dependent event? It certainly has been uh, for a very long time. They are trying to reform the situation. Uh, one wishes them luck. I would remind them of something that Jacques Anquetil, a five-time winner of the Tour, said in 1967. He said, if you want us to ride 2,000 miles at an average speed of 15 miles an hour, there's no problem. We'll drink milk. If you want us to ride at an average speed of 25 miles an hour, which is about 40 kilometers an hour, and the average uh, is now up around 41 kilometers an hour, he says, I'm sorry, we're simply going to have to use drugs. Now, interestingly, that uh, quote did not really scandalize anyone. Uh, the world was not prepared to engage in uh, outrage over performance enhancing drugs at this time. Uh, but in that sense, there's no question about it. You wouldn't have 15 million people on the road if these guys were pedaling along uh, at about the same speed that you and I could manage. Doping and commercialization in the Olympic Games, the amateurism paragraph was thrown out by IRC President Samaranch in, in 1981. Uh, Samaranch was IRC President between 1980 and 2001. Uh, he ran the drug testing operation uh, in, in competition at the event uh, as basically an ineffectual exercise in, in public relations. Uh, between 1968 and 1996, that's eight Olympiads enrolling maybe 40 to 50,000 athletes, there were 52 positives. In other words, you had one positive per thousand athletes at the Olympic Games between 68 and 96. A handful of those were steroid positives. Most of it was junk like this or that stimulant. So the Olympic movement so-called uh, was also changed by the Great Tour Scandal of 1998, which led to the formation of the World uh, Anti-Doping Agency in 99, goes into business on the first day of 2000, January the 1st, and they have taken on uh, an authority in this world with regard to setting standards for athletes and drug testing that is, is, is awesome in its power. Uh, there are human costs to drug testing, but don't underestimate uh, legal minds out there the extent to which the rulings of the World Anti-Doping Agency uh, are actually leaking into the law, even though these are, not, these are not legally empowered people, they are not elected people. So the prestige and influence of WADA, so-called, and its norm setting for commercialized sports, uh, is a very significant factor in this world. And when professional sports organizations are trying to look better with regard to their drug testing regimens, uh, they will either say, well, we're, we're following the WADA norms, or they will be told you are not credible unless you are following the WADA norms. Uh, this is the agency that's headquartered in Montreal and was headed for the first seven years uh, by Dick Pound of the IOC. They are a fact to be reckoned with. There are, there are two wars on drugs in this world. There is the war on drugs that was proclaimed by Richard Nixon in 1971 and that continues for better or for worse, perhaps for worse. And there is the war against performance enhancing drugs, primarily anabolic steroids, that was federalized in February of 2004 when Attorney General Ashcroft made sure that it was he who stood before the television cameras and announced the Balco indictments that took down Victor Conte and his, his colorful associates. So what happens in February of 2004 is that the anti-steroid campaign is federalized. It is, in effect, absorbed by the larger war on drugs. This is the context in which all major sports organizations with drug problems, and there's lots of them, this is the context 
in which executives worry and tremble and stay up at night wondering uh, how many of their people are using drugs and how they are going to be perceived in terms of uh, trying to quote unquote clean up the sport. Uh, I mentioned the, the very important uh, turning event in March of 05 when the, uh, the House Committee uh, goes after uh, Bud Selig and some of his baseball players. Uh, this is a very interesting thing that now you have in effect a relationship between the federal government and a huge professional, a nine billion dollar professional sports establishment uh, like the NFL as it was just described to us. Um, that's interesting. That, and not only that, this is a bipartisan consensus. It is, this is the only bipartisanship in Washington these days is Republicans and Democrats agreeing that the NFL should darn well institute uh, human growth hormone testing and that the players' union uh, should give up its, its caviling objections uh, to doing so. Interestingly, as I noted, a month after Bud Selig was absorbing that abuse from the Congressional Committee in March of 05, in April of 05, uh, Paul Tagliabue goes before Congress and is treated very gently. Uh, at that hearing, <clears throat> Paul Tagliabue says, look, we have been testing since 1989. Uh, we, are, we have some numbers for you. In the 16 years that elapsed between 1989 and, uh, and 2005, we've had 54 positives, 54 positives. In other words, just under four positives in a year in a league that employs uh, a subpopulation of athletes who at least hypothetically would benefit from anabolic steroids at least as much as any other subpopulation of athletes on the face of the earth. You know, I have, um, uh, just a couple more minutes. I wanted to read a quote from Philippe Bondi, a fairly well-known um, sports writer at the New York Daily News. Uh, this is October 25th of this year, a couple of weeks ago. He says, and I, I, this is in relation to this ongoing drama, this public drama of controlling hormone-boosting drug use by NFL athletes who, according to Mr. Bidwell, uh, are perhaps the most important popular athletes on the face of the earth. And Philippe Bundy says, you walk through an NFL locker room and it does not resemble any other clubhouse in sports. This is not like an NBA locker room where the players are unusually tall but naturally proportioned. The necks, the arms, the shoulders of these linemen, running backs and linebackers appear extraterrestrial, unquote. <clears throat> what, if anything, is going to be done to change uh, the phenotypes of NFL athletes? Is the Congress really going to uh, assign itself a mandate to intervene in this way? Uh, finally, <clears throat> Uh, we've got, as I said, the Congress is now uh, on the, 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 door, door, the growth hormone issue. And the last two things I wanted to mention, because this is a conference about the sports business, was uh, it was noted that Mark McGuire's past steroid use was not mentioned during Fox coverage of the World Series. Uh, this is one you can debate back and forth, but once again you come up with uh, an interesting question. What sort of responsibility does a medium that is broadcasting um, professional sports have in terms of educating the public so-called, of not pretending that uh, Mark McGuire was not who he was. On the other side, you could say, look, everybody knows that Mark McGuire was using. Why spoil the mood by bringing it up? 
And I think we can assume that the, the business interests that put on the World Series, and obviously Fox that was broadcasting the World Series, concluded uh, that this was simply not an appropriate topic for, for that occasion. Finally, it turns out that in the new film Moneyball, there is no mention of steroid use. It's all about the Oakland A's, it's all about the Oakland A's during the steroid era, uh, but there's no mention of steroids. And so again, does the entertainment industry have a social obligation to present recent history in a responsible or uncensored way, the larger context being, does the professional sports industry uh, or the Olympic movement, which is an arm of the professional sports industry, have a, an appropriate role in the war on drugs? So I'll conclude with that and thank you for your attention.